sitting down there because he's still recovering. And I'm sure that's okay. You'll be able to hear him and you'll be able to see the slides. Right. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Modern. Uh, you know, it's amazing what phones can do now with the voice quality still just as lousy as it was <laughs> 15 years ago. Truly amazing. But anyway, uh, first a uh, word about this. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, I, after I retired from the Air Force and I was a test pilot school graduate, uh, I was picked up uh, by Northrop uh, as an armaments engineer and also as a flight test whistle on the B-2. Uh, <clears throat> I was always very interested in flying wings, even from the time I was a kid. I collected airplane bubblegum cards in the 50s, and one of my favorites was the, the RB-49. I actually had a bubblegum card for it. But I never thought I would end up flying the modern incarnation of the 1940s Northrop Big Flying Wings. In 1995, when I'd been flying the airplane for about four years, the Air Force decided that they were going to put the B-2 on display at the Paris Air Show. So Northrop was expected, and Northrop said, boy, that sounds really good to us. So I was all set, along with our chief test pilot, to go to the Paris Air Show to man the booth after the B-2 landed at Paris. A week and a half before we were due to go, the Air Force Security Mafia decided they did not want the B-2 to be on the ground in Paris for about 10 days. So they said, no, you're not going. But Northup said, well, you kind of promised us we are going to do it. So he said, tell you what, said, we will fly with an Air Force crew, a B-2, from Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri, and land at Le Bourget. And uh, we will then change crews, and then they will fly right back to Whiteman Air Force Base. So Northup said, OK, I guess if that's what, you know, Golden rule, you're the guys with gold, so you make the rules. So, okay, we'll do that. So then the North of Public Affairs guys said, well, since there's not going to be a V2 on the ground, you guys, you flight, North of flight crews, will not be going to the Paris Air Show. So I sat down and wrote a memo, said, you guys do not understand. There has never been a giant flying wing at the Paris Air Show in the 75 years it's been there. Said, I don't have to go. You gotta have somebody there. Because if you think just because the B-2 isn't there, the fact that it comes in like the bat plane, appears for an hour and a half and then disappears, I said, everybody is gonna flood your booth. So you need to have somebody that knows what a B-2 looks like. So nobody in management would forward that letter to the public affairs people. So, so we didn't go. So happened I ran into a Hughes guy because I was giving a talk on the B-2 in South Carolina about three weeks later. He was at the Paris Air Show. I said, how did it go? He said, everything you predicted came true. He said, the B-2 came in and made a touch and go, and Le Bourget is right next to the main freeway into Paris. People stopped their cars. The traffic jam took three hours to untangle. They got out of their cars and just gaped at the airplane and waited to see it come back around again. He said. Everybody was talking for the entire Paris Air Show because they'd start the conversations. Were you here when the B-2 showed up? <laughs> they flooded our stand and all they had was these little black, looks like a moth, 
lapel pins to give out for free. Those lasted two hours. <laughs> By the end of the air show, you could sell yours for 25 bucks. <laughs> it was like the 1984 Olympics. So I said, it's, it's really amazing uh, the, the fact a giant flying wing really impresses people. And uh, so, as you can see from the date on this, for the centennial, the European Symposium, uh, the Society of Experimental Test Pilots is a worldwide organization. Most of the test pilots are in the United States. We have an annual symposium in Southern California. It used to be at Beverly Hill, in Beverly, at the Beverly Hilton. Now it's at the Grand California. Uh, in, down in Disneyland. But I went to that for about 25 years, but I'd never gone to the European Symposium. But I was looking at it, and they said, call for papers, and they said, we really want historical papers. I said, oh, wonder where they're holding it. The answer was, they were holding it at the Aero Club of France, which is in Paris, about two blocks from the Arc de Triomphe. And I said, wow, the Aero Club of France. That's where Wilbur Wright gave a presentation in 1908, where all the Europeans decided the Wright brothers really did know how to fly. They weren't charlatans. So if I get picked to do to, for this paper, I will get to give a talk in the same room where Wilbur Wright did. Got to do that. So I started to write the paper on my own. Uh, the European Symposium folks said, you're in, we really want that paper. Because even test pilots really want to know about flying wings. So I put the paper together and the company was kind enough once they looked at it, they said, tell you what, we will fund you. Because I was going to do this all on my own nickel, including paying to go over and all like that. So since now they're paying for my hotel room and for my flight over, I use the money to bring my wife over with me. Because it was our 30th anniversary and we'd actually had to spend our honeymoon in Paris. That date, June 14th. So that was kind of cool, especially for the company to do that. But the real reason I wrote the paper was to clear up a lot of misconceptions. I was really kind of tired about hearing people say, oh yeah, flying wings really crash, and the only reason the B-2 doesn't crash is because of your digital fly-by-wire system. I said, not true, not true, not true. All of the airplanes in here, with the exception of the B-2, did not have fly-by-wire systems even analog fly-by-wire systems. Flying wings actually could fly very well. It's just they were tricky. The advantage of the digital fly-by-wire system is it makes the airplanes what we call carefree. If you try to do anything stupid, the computer will outvote you. And that's kind of the advantage of digital fly-by-wire systems. Nowadays, we can make a brick seem like the greatest flying airplane in history. It's all due to the fact that basically our digital fly-by-wire systems operate about eight times as fast as a human reaction time does. It takes about 125 milliseconds for a human brain to hear a command, process it, and then make muscle movement like to press a button or something like that. It's about 125 milliseconds, which is about an eighth of a second. Our digital fly-by-wire systems all work on either 50 or 60 cycles per second, so they operate six times as fast. So as a result, you have what we call artificial stability, because the digital system will correct any uncommanded motion before it ever gets very large. And that is the advantage. The, F, the, the B-2 takes, really does take advantage of that. And by the way, the B-2 is the first military <coughs> system to use quad-redundant digital fly-by-wire because it was developed in the 1980s when we had enough confidence in digital fly-by-wire. 
But all these other airplanes were done the hard way. So that's what I wanted to talk about and to compare the myths that appeared about the YB-49 and with what we got in the B-2, which is why they picked my paper, because they said, yours is the number two paper. When we voted on it, yours is the number two. So that was cool. So, SEP, CTP, European Symposium. I have given this paper to Northrop audiences probably 15 times. That's why I can sit over here, because I've got it kind of memorized. <laughs> but I'll, I'll share with you. Next slide, please. Okay, homage, 1903. This is the Wright Brothers uh, Kitty Hawk Flyer, of course. It's now on the ground in its own room at the National Air and Space Museum. This is when they still had it suspended from the ceiling. And, of course, what is that thing in the background? It's Chuck Yeager's spelling this one. Very nice picture. But that is the idea of an airplane. It has a wing, and it has a tail, and it has control surfaces, which in the case of the right flyer, were in the front rather than in the back. So the tail was actually split in two by the right, right flyer. Next slide. Now, most people associate uh, Jack Northup with flying wings. In reality, there are a few other things, but he really was a fanatic about this. He was born in Santa Barbara. Uh, basically, he was a self-taught uh, aeronautical engineer, not, never got a degree. He was the first Lockheed employee. He was employee number one. He was a structures engineering specialist. He was the responsible for the Lockheed Vega, which was the plywood monocoque airplane that uh, Wiley Post used to fly around the world, Amelia Earhart used to fly across the Atlantic. Uh, he also was responsible basically uh, for the Altair, uh, which Charles Lindbergh flew, but he was a structures guy. So he designed the Vega, but then in 1929 he started his own company. And he actually built these two airplanes, both of which are in the National Air and Space Museum downtown. The Alpha, which was an airliner. It was sort of like a handsome cab. The pilot sat outside in front, and the uh, passenger sat in front of him. Uh, basically, it was sort of like a handsome cab during Sherlock Holmes days. And the Northrop Gamma, which is the quintessential example of streamlining in the 1930s. Uh, using that airplane, that particular airplane, they basically uh, were able to uh, fly from coast to coast at 25,000 feet above the weather. And they discovered that there were tailwinds when you're going from California to New York, that you could go a lot faster and you didn't have turbulence. So that particular airplane was quite important. But it was 1929 and basically uh, they couldn't sell enough airplanes for the company to stay in business. So the first Northrop company actually folded about 1932, and Jack Northrop went to work for Donald Douglas. He actually took a version of the, of the uh, Gamma on the right and made it into a warplane called the A-17, which uh, Douglas sold to the Army Air Force. And the Navy said, we like that design too, and it had a very efficient wing structure, a uh, box girder, so to speak, which really saves you a lot of weight. Because remember, Jack Northam really liked to save weight in the airplanes. He used the same wing structure for the DC-1, DC-2, DC-3 series. So actually, that design uh, that Jack Northam brought with him <coughs> to, excuse me, to Douglas actually really helped start a lot of air, start a a lot of commercial aviation, and helped us win the Battle of Midway, by the way, because those were Douglas Douglas's that sank the Japanese carriers during the Battle of Midway, which used Northrop's mock structure. Next slide, please. Okay, but he really liked get doing away with unnecessary structure, so he said, if we just had a flying wing you could minimize the drag 
you could minimize the aerodynamic efficiency by having a wing that was nothing but a wing with no obstructions. And by doing that, you could maximize either the payload or the range. Or, or the range. So in the, with his first company, he basically said, OK, this is going to be a low-cost prototype program. So I am going to build an airplane where the pilot, the uh, fuel, the payload, which was only two people, et cetera, are all housed in a rather thick wing. But he didn't really know how to control it. So he said, so I will stick a tail on it like a conventional airplane on these little thin booms behind it. And he said, actually, that seemed to work pretty well. But the company went bust shortly after that. So he just said, OK, well, think about that. Um, as World War II approached, basically, Northrop uh, basically started his own company up again. So uh, actually, the modern Northrop company dates from 1939. Uh, and uh, basically, he said, OK, I'll start uh, building uh, more conventional airplanes to sell them like to the Norwegians of all people. They actually built a bunch of float planes for the Norwegians that uh, the Norwegians just loved. The Air Force, of course, didn't care about float planes. They didn't care about them that much. But he was still enamored with the flying wing. But he said, now i got some resources. Next slide. So why don't I try and improve that? And this is what he came up with. This was known as the Jeep. It's a fairly small airplane. It is in the National Air and Space Museum. It is actually out at Udverhazi uh, in uh, Dulles. It still exists today. And I actually have a book on the restoration of this airplane. It was a one-of-a-kind airplane. Next slide. It was a pure flying wing. It was only a 38-foot span, so it was pretty little. Uh, weighed about 4,000 pounds. Twin engines. They were only 65 horsepower each. So this thing weren't as, wasn't exactly a racing plane. In fact, it was so underpowered that when they decided to test it up in the high desert at Rogers Dry Lake, they had to have a DC-3 tow it over the San Gabriels because it couldn't, it couldn't climb over the San Gabriels from Santa Monica even to get to the high desert. It was really underpowered. His control system was interesting because now he figured out how he, how he was going to control it, pitch and roll were done by control surfaces on the trailing edge of the wing, which served as both elevators. When they worked together, they would work, the left and the right one would move together to pitch the nose up and down. And if you wanted to roll, they'd work differentially. So one of them would go up and the other one would go down. So that was what caused the plane to roll. The question was, what do you use for yaw? And the way I used to explain it to people, say, picture you are in a rowboat. Said, it has a tiller at the back. You accidentally drop the tiller overboard. How are you going to get back to the dock? And the answer is, well, if you have an outboard motor, you can stick your arms out in the water on either side to cause differential drag in order to make the boat turn around and go back to the dock, which is exactly the concept that a flying wing uses. You put drag surfaces out on the wingtips, and because they're so far out, all you have to do is open them just a little bit. It'll create enough differential drag to be equal to a rudder deflection from a tail that's normally behind you but isn't. A lot of people are not aware of the fact, we all think of this as a flying wing. The actual designation of this type of airplane is called a tailless airplane. Some airplanes actually are completely tailless. They have no tail back there. An airplane like the Vulcan jet bomber, which is a huge flying wing, but it's also got a huge tail with a huge rudder. That's a semi-tailless aircraft. I was talking with a Vulcan pilot about it. He said some of the characteristics he described about the B-2 we actually have in the in the Vulcan also. He said, I, I didn't even realize that. I said, yeah, it actually is similar. So anyway, so he said, so pitch roll and yaw, basically we solved the problem. 
the outer wings, because this was experimental, he said, do you need to sweep the wingtips and do you need to droop them? They really didn't know. So they actually made the airplane in such a way that you could reconfigure the airplane between flights with variable sweep wingtips. You can only adjust it on the ground and even variable drip, droop wingtips. They discovered that uh, the swept wing wasn't necessary. All flying wings have got to have a wing sweep in order that the control surfaces are far enough away from the center of gravity that they have an effect on pits roll yaw and that type of thing. Droop was totally unnecessary, so you never see flying wings with droop anymore. Next slide. Engine problems, because it was underpowered. The handling qualities, everyone said, because it's a little airplane, it's about like a, you know, it's a little bit larger than a Cessna 172. The rudder clamshells worked just right. He said, you stepped on the rudder pedals, and instead of moving a rudder behind you, you're actually opening the clamshells on the wingtips, and they worked fine. It was quite pitch sensitive, which wasn't surprising because the control surfaces were actually fairly powerful even though they weren't that far away from the center of gravity. So he said, it's kind of pitch sensitive and you gotta get used to that. The biggest thing they discovered is if you went to high angles of attack in the flying wing, because this was a fully reversible flight control system like a Piper Cub, if you went beyond a certain angle of attack, suddenly because you're pulling back on the stick and suddenly you have to push forward otherwise the nose will rise so that's called stick reverse uh, control force reversal it's really bad in high angle of attack performance so they said we don't understand why that's occurring and uh, actually they went to theodore von Karman at jpl who was one of the world's aeronautical specialists and said and he explained the behavior, and uh, basically he said, it's probably due to the fact that when you get that thick a wing to a high angle of attack, there's a lot of disturbed air behind it, and said, and your elevons are buried in that disturbed air. So as a result, if you get too, too high an angle of attack, the disturbed air is really disturbed, and now your control services, since muscle power is all you're using to control it, reverses. So you now have to push instead of pull. Quite dangerous. But he said the way you would solve it is by having your elevons further aft. Either thin the wing or have your elevons further aft so it's out of the disturbed area. But nobody really did anything about this. Next slide, please. And they actually had a press day for this. The color footage you see right there was taken by Jack Northrop himself. He was a home movie buff and he did it in color. This is a uh, basically a newsreel that was taken. This shows the airplane flying around, or first taxiing around on Rogers Dry Lake, which is where Edwards is now. And there it is taking off from the familiar dry lake bed. You can see there are no computers in this airplane. This is manual flying. And you'll notice the test pilot doesn't seem to be scared of it at all. And horses it around is a pretty nice airplane. This particular, uh, that particular video was taken in black and white by Jack North of the Chase Point. The date of that video and that press day was December 4th, 1941. December 7th, everything changed as America was going to war. Jack Northrop was very well known in the industry, including by Hap Arnold, who was chief of the Army Air Force. Now they're getting ready to go to war. Next slide, please. So basically, they said England may fall because we're not really sure whether or not it will. So we need a really long-range bomber. And the bombers we have now uh, won't give us what we want, which is a 10,000 mile unrefueled range while carrying a 10,000 pound bomb load. So uh, 
Northrop said, you know, with a big flying wing, we might be able to meet that. So basically, the Army Air Force gave uh, Northrop a contract in summer of 41, summer of 41. And the design of the airplane was going to have four 3,000 horsepower engines with contra-rotating pusher propellers. You notice that both the 1929 flying wing and the N1 had pusher props because he didn't want to have propellers on the leading edge of the wing where it would disturb the aerodynamic purity of the wing. So that's why they all had pushers. So, but to go from something that's 38 feet wide to something that's going to be 172 feet wide, it's a bit of a stretch. So they said, we'll make some subscale flying mock-ups as a risk reduction measure. Next slide. This is the N9M flying test beds. They never got serial numbers because they were not considered as airplanes. They were considered as flying mock-ups, believe it or not. That's what the M stands for. <clears throat> so here's the first one. They had a 60-foot span, two 300-horsepower engines. At least it could have cleared the San Gabriels. With pusher props, it weighed about 7,000 pounds. So it was a little bit heavy. Again, it used elevons for pitch and roll, and it used wingtip devices of somewhat a different design than the N1. So, you can see, you notice the airplane is painted oddly. It's painted uh, blue on the top and yellow on the bottom. Uh, the reason for that was they discovered using black and white film, you could not tell if the airplane was upside down or right side up. <laughs> on black and white film. And believe it or not, Aviation Week, the first poster they did, it had a great picture of the B-2 on it. They printed the posters with the pictures upside down. <laughs> <laughs> they thought they were looking at the top of the B-2. I said, no, you can see the little streaks at the bottom. So, uh, and because it was a cloudy day, the clouds and the, it didn't it conceal the earth. So. I have one of those calendars, but I said it's a common problem, and it's actually why they painted their airplanes <laughs> blue and yellow. How many of the N9Ms did that North? <coughs> Say again. How many N9Ms did North? Four, and Four. you'll see you'll see that in a minute. I thought my boss had a picture with nine of them flying formation. No, no. Okay. Oh, I, I may know what what you're thinking of, but no, no, it's, yeah. it's just four, and you'll see, and you'll see in a minute. Next slide. <coughs> Okay, the N9M1, again, had manual flight controls, you know, reversible, just like the N1. Four and opening clamshell speed brakes. Now, the person who thought that was a good idea missed the fact that your control surfaces are going to be blanked by opening clamshells opening that way. Uh, in reality, the test pilots realized that too, and they insisted the clamshells be wired shut because I said that's a disaster asking for a place to happen. It had a rather weird scoop spoiler rudder on the underside of the wing tip that actually had a very small port that opened and did some wizardry with air flowing inside the wing in order to create differential drag. Quite complicated, did not work very well. It crashed after only 22 flying hours, killing pilot Max Stanley. At Pet Max Constant. It was a stall test at FCG. Uh, they had spin shoots on either wingtip, and you would deploy that if you got in a spin and couldn't get out of it. That was kind of standard practice for, uh, for uh, lightweight airplanes in those days. The left spin shoot was deployed, but the airplane was still in a spin at impact. Bailout was unsuccessful. Uh, the canopy had been jettisoned. The pilot's lap belt was undone, and he never got out of the airplane. They theorized what happened is because the airplane was still basically stalled, was it had control reversal, and the yoke had come back and pinned him in the cockpit. So, uh, so they said, all right, we obviously don't understand something about flying wings. 
So where do we go? We go to the NACA Spin Tunnel at Langley, Virginia. Next slide. Uh, as I said, I wrote my master's thesis on spins, and uh, I was at the University of Virginia, and Langley uh, is not that far away, and I actually have been to the NACA spin tunnel. The spin tunnel is like what they now use for skydiving experiences. It's a vertical shaft going up and down, and you know, you put on a wingsuit, you know, do that. They actually have one on a cruise ship now, as a matter of fact, which I thought must be interesting, gyroscopic effects the ship is pitching and rolling at the same time. Uh, what you do is you throw the model out into the wind tunnel like a frisbee. Because this, this spin tunnel has been there since the 1930s. So the guys that operate the tunnel have calibrated wrists, basically. They say, we want to start with a spin at 27 degrees per second or something like that, and they'll experiment with the thing, and they had instrumentation, said, okay, yeah, that's, that's what it's got. Then you see what happens to the spin, and you have remote controls that you could actually put, uh, move control services to look at spin recoveries, why the thing is actually in the spin tunnel. So it's a rather Rube Goldberg thing, but it works. And you're not going to believe this, but when I was doing research for this, and I went back to visit there, it turns out they said, you know, we really can't tell anyone, but the B-2 was here before it flew. He said, you're kidding. I said, yeah, they took the models away, though, because they were classified. Now they're unclassified, and I was able to get with one of our engineers, and we found the model, so we presented it to NASA. <clears throat> Uh, but the spin recovery characteristics for a flying wing were really weird. Ailerons against the spin is what the natural inclination that everybody uses. Rudder with the spin is what you need to get out of the spin. And that is due to the fact that your rudder is not back here, your rudder is out there. So as a result, they were really surprised at that. And they said the B-35 uh, basically uh, said the N-9M, because it's such a little airplane, the characteristics change at different flight conditions. But they said, based upon this recommendation for flying wings, we recommend for spin recovery, aileron against and rudder with the spin for recovery. And while they were doing this frisbee out uh, thing, uh, basically, uh, just out of curiosity, they said, well, watch this. So in addition to flipping it this way, they would also flip their wrist like that so the thing would tumble longitudinally in addition to spinning this way. And they said, you know, if you try that with a normal airplane, it will not work with a flying wing, it will. So they just said, you know, it's if you if you throw it with enough of a twist to begin with, with a high initial pitch rate, it is possible if you have an FCG for the thing in addition to going like that, also it goes like that. So I said, but nobody's ever going to do something stupid like that, right? Right. So anyway, next slide. Okay, uh, so now 1943, I said there's still a war to be won, so we built a second N9M1, got rid of that stupid port opening speed break. Uh, they actually did flight tests, and they said the, the, when we flight tested it, it showed more drag than the wind tunnel did. But being, in, being engineers, they trust the wind tunnel far more than they trust test pilots mm -hmm. in the real world. So when, actually, they said, it must be something wrong with the N9M. So they actually took the N9M, which has a 60-foot win, uh, wingspan, and flew it in the Ames full-size wind tunnel, because it would fit. They actually had a pilot inside it. That would drive a safety officer right up the wall today to actually have a human in a wind tunnel while <laughs> the wind tunnel is operating. Because if anything goes wrong, you are going to be mincemeat. <laughs> but apparently they had trusting pilots and all like that, so they did it. 
to cross-check the drag figures and it turned out no, the model, the, the, the flight test showed the same thing. So they said, okay, so we believe them now. Next slide. Now they built two more. They flew in 1944 and 45, the N9MA and B. It had the final configuration, which was going to be the same as the B-35 you see over there on the 60-foot uh, airplane, 60-foot uh, airplane. It had hydraulically boosted flight controls, the N9MB did, because they said this airplane is so big that you're going to need hydraulic boost just to move the control surfaces. So it actually is the, as far as we can tell, it is the first airplane ever flown in the United States that had irreversible flight controls. Uh, it, but in addition, it had the manual reversible flight controls, and they just used the hydraulics as a test bed. Uh, they completed the test programs. So there were no further aircraft losses. And basically, they said, okay, now we're moving on to the full-scale one, so we will just give rides to test pilots in the uh, three N9Ms we have left. Next slide. Pilot comments. It's very sensitive in pitch, just like the N1M was. Five to six overshoots from a rudder kick. Because it doesn't have a tail, a tail is what usually damps out yaw and uh, roll and pitch, or uh, yaw and, and uh, and uh, roll are linked together. So if you look at an airplane, if you kick the rudder from behind, you'll see the airplane kind of wallows like this until the motion is damp out. With the flying wing, it takes a lot of overshoots before it finally damps out. A typical uh, airplane with a wing and tail, it'll damp out about two overshoots. Uh, <clears throat> ground cushion effect. Ground cushion is due to the fact when you are very close to the ground uh, at less than half span of the wing, your angle of attack, the downwash bounces off the ground and in essence reduces your angle of attack. So you have a tendency, uh, basically if you're coming down, to float somewhat. Most normal airplanes, you know, and I've flown a lot of normal airplanes, uh, but just before you touch down, because you're descending at seven or 800 feet per minute, you pull back on the stick, which lifts the nose somewhat, you get more lift, and it cushions your landing. With a flying wing, the way I described it to someone, because I've landed the B-2 a number of times, said, think about, you say, right about here is about where I would flare. I won't do it. This is not necessary for this airplane, but I don't want to develop bad habits. Right here is where I would flare. Just think about it. Don't do it. Because the airplane lands itself. Uh, basically, uh, also, if you're heavily loaded, <coughs> when you take off, basically, as you fly out of ground condition, the plane has a tendency to sink. So you have to watch that. So. Uh, so anyway, that last comment surprised it fl flew so well. That comment was made by an Air Force captain uh, named Edwards. Because he flew the N9M a number of times and really liked it. Next slide. There she is. If you go out to Chino, you can see her just like this. And here we have a formation flight of three N9Ms. That's the largest formation they Again, there she is, looking very neat and uh, sleek. You'll notice it's rather hard when she banks away from you to tell whether she's coming at you or going away from you because it doesn't have a tail. It's just a flying wing just appears as a line in the sky. You notice there, as he flew out of ground cushion, there's a slight sink. And like I said, if you're ready for it, that's, that's really no problem. If you're heavily loaded, that might be a different matter. 
and I'll explain that later on. Again, the airplane vanishes, basically, uh, when it's a distance away. There, you notice the float, just when it's going down the land on the lake bed at Edwards. It's very hell, hard to tell your distance above the lake bed at Edwards, by the way. Uh, it's kind of featureless, so it's, it's why they have bubbles in Olympic diving pools so that the, uh, basically the divers can see where the water is if you don't have some reference. Landing, uh, landing on the lake bed at Edwards, I often compare it to a fly landing on a really large soup bowl. Probably has exactly the same problem. <laughs> Next slide. So the XB-35 arrived after the war, 1946, for a 3,000 horsepower engine, dual rotating pusher props, major reliability props. Prop shafts, gearboxes, governors, dual props, uh, contra rotating is like having a mix master, a really powerful mix master. So they actually went to single rotation props to see if maybe that caused all the vibrations. No, it didn't do anything. They flew two B-35s, and they flew a total of 27 missions in three years. But it really didn't make that much difference, because it's 1946, and they'd already made the decision in 1945 that they were going to put jets on the flying wing. Next slide. But first, we'll see the B-35. And I want you to pay special attention. There's a P-61 chase plane in here. Uh, you may have to click or something like that for some reason. That's not picking up. No, go back. Go back again. No. Okay, now go forward. Okay, later on I'll try and uh, run that okay. video for it for some reason. Okay. It's not tripping like the others did. Okay, okay next slide. They actually built 13 big flying wings. There they are, they're on the ground in Hawthorne. And if you've ever been to Hawthorne, you know how much real estate that would have taken up. So they were awaiting the decision to what they were gonna put in, turboprops or jets. So as a result, it was taking up a lot of space at Hawthorne. But they said, okay, we're gonna put jets in, next slide. YV-49, eight 4,000 pound thrust turbojet engines. Wow, extra fuel tanks in the Bombay. The jets were quite fuel thirsty. So as a result, some of the Bombays were sealed and made into fuel tanks. Nevertheless, it still cut the, the proposed range for the YV-49 to only 4,000 miles, which is actually across the Atlantic. They actually had to put four vestigial tails on the airplane because they removed the prop discs, which actually had a stabilizing influence on the airplane. So basically, they put those four tails on it. There are no rudders on them. They are literally just intended to give additional side area for uh, yaw stability. The, the flight control system was exactly the same as the B-35. So anyway, next slide, and hopefully this one will trigger. Yes, it did. And this is the first flight of the YB-29. That wasn't a fearless cameraman. They actually just put the camera down the runway. You've got to scare a lot of cameras. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it took off. Once you suck the gear up, it is a really, this is the footage that was used in the War of the Worlds. 1950s as being a futuristic airplane. This is actually that footage. I was a little disappointed when I saw the B-2 with this rather weird W-shaped wing because I was expecting something like that, which actually looked like a 1930s serial. <laughs> now, is he coming toward you or going away? Can't tell. Next slide. Okay, the YB-49 test program ended in probably the most well-known aeronautical crash until the B-70 collision. Uh, but I'm gonna talk about the high angle of attack behavior, the stability of the 
UIV 49 and how was it as a bombing platform, which was its purpose. Next slide. <clears throat> the accident. Ship 2 was lost in June of 48 and it only made about 25 flights. With its crew of five, all died. <clears throat> Cause was never definitely established. There was no chase aircraft. It was on a Saturday. There were no radio calls. I found the original flight cards in the archives of the Air Force History uh, Center. And the plan was they were going to go to 40,000 feet and do cruise performance tests. This was Air Force Phase 2 testing. One of the things they did was verify the handbook figures for range performance and all like that. They did what we call W over delta, a very boring type thing. It's like doing a trim shot for three minutes and then taking your hands off the controls and reading, seeing, seeing how much gas you use during that three minutes. From, from that, you can verify the handbook drag figures. But then they were going to go down from 40,000 feet and do approaches to stalls. And the way the card was worded, it said, do approaches to stall, and if it stalls cleanly, we want you to do approaches to stalls, snapping two bottles back on one side while you do that. And I read that and went, that's not performance testing. The B the YB-49, they never completed high angle of attack testing. That was the contractor's responsibility. And they discontinued it on the XB-35 because they said, this is too dangerous because there's no way to get out of this airplane if something goes wrong. So we're just going to just do the cruise stuff, which is all the Air Force needs to do. But the Air Force kind of apparently decided to familiarize themselves with the airplane, they were going to do, do something that had never actually been evaluated by the contractor. They were going to do it at 15,000 feet near Mirac. The ground was at 3,000 feet. Said so doing a low altitude approaches to a stall on an airplane that you've never stalled before, that's really weird. So the outer, uh, when they went to the wreckage, by the way, in case you're wondering, it crashed between uh, Highway 58 and California City. You can still go out there with a metal detector and find pieces of the airplane scattered around there. It's right next to the high tension lines. <laughs> but, yes? Did this one have the box fires? It actually had a variation on it because of wing, a, a, a thing where the wing has to do all the thing. You can't build it the way you do a conventional airplane like the DC-3, etc. Uh, they found the outer wingtips a half mile from the center body uh, in either direction. Uh, Looking at the pieces of it, it was obvious that the wing had failed in over-G, that basically they'd snapped the wings off. The center section hit flat with little forward motion. Uh, their uh, history office actually has a lot of pictures of the wreckage of the airplane, the way it was uh, actually done out. Uh, next slide. Okay, basically they said, we really don't understand what happened, but meanwhile, another Air Force pilot reported that the YB-49 had tumbled. He said he was doing, again, one of those approaches to stalls they weren't supposed to be doing. Flying wings actually don't need to go to high angles of attack because they got so much wing area, they actually fly at a very limited angle of attack range. So stalling the thing, hopefully you will never ever stall the airplane. But he said the impression he got was that it tumbled over backwards and everything he tried to recover didn't work until his head, apparently he wasn't strapped in completely tightly, hit 
the, the throttles on the B-35 and the B-49 were, the individual throttles were actually controlled by a flight engineer who was sitting back here. The pilot had only two throttles, each one of which controlled four engines. So while he was being tossed around in the cockpit, he said his head hit one of the throttles, which changed the yaw on the thing and it came out of whatever it was. So yeah, he uh, basically, uh, so he said he recommended the airplane should be placarded, no intentional assaults permitted. Duh. <laughs> An airplane that weighs 200,000 pounds, you're going to go out and stall it like a Cessna 172? I don't think so, especially with that weird a configuration. So Jack Northup said, yeah, we, we will do that. We're going to do that anyway. Okay. So now they decided to do the high angle of attack tests after this that had never been done before. A pilot named Charlie Tucker drew the, drew the short straw for, North, for Northrop, and he did the tests. He started at 30,000 feet and uh, with forward CG, and he also started with the gear and flaps down which is you usually do power on stalls in that configuration before you do turning stalls in a clean configuration. The Air Force guys apparently were doing it in a clean configuration when the YB-49 uh, number two crashed. So, so he said, Ford CG, I'm doing the traditional test pilot thing. You approach the stall gingerly and all like that. He said, it was fine. He said, you let loose of the back. Back pressure, nose drops, stalled over. It's a wonderful thing. He said, one thing he didn't notice was that the airplane always fell off on the right wing. And he said, okay, the airplane's probably built that way, slightly heavier on the right side, etc. So, so it always fell off on the right side. So he said, okay, as you move the CG aft, and I've done this, uh, not in the B2. Uh, T-38, uh, you got an increasingly rapid nose rise with this yoke movement. And 30% CG, uh, he could not stop the nose rise even though he pushed full forward yoke. So the, the wing stalled and it entered a steep spin to the right. Uh, after two turns, he recovered it. A flying wing picks up speed really fast if the nose is pointed downhill. When you recover from a spin or a stall, your nose is pointed downhill. You pick up speed really, really fast. He basically, because the airplane was only a 2G airplane, he said, okay, I'll only pull 2Gs to recover, but the ground is coming up really fast and I'm going to pull two and a half Gs. So he actually leveled at 8,000 feet after starting at 30,000. So my personal thought on the matter, and again, as I say, my master's thesis was actually spins using a computer, uh, actually just before I went to test pilot school. You cannot over G an airplane if it is stalled. So he said the airplane, the fact that the airplane basically was over G'd and it came apart meant it was not stalled. What is most likely is that they basically actually did that business about if it stalls cleanly, snap the throttles back as it stalls. That is asking for a multi-engine airplane that's asking to enter a spin. And I talked to Rush Schley, who basically told an Air Force audience that we did not know that rudder into the spin was recovery. I actually got hold of a YB-49 copy, a uh, flight manual copy. It's worded very oddly said they probably did not realize that 
brother into the spin is the is the immediate recovery. Because everybody that's ever flown airplanes in those days, they used to spin them all the time, nose rudder against is the way you get out of a spin, not with a flying wing. Charlie Tucker, when he was actually doing this test, when the airplane basically fell off on the right wing, he actually put rudder against the spin. The instrumentation tape showed it for about three seconds. He probably induced the spin. And he went, oh shit. And basically then recovered it after only two turns. The interesting part is that spin was actually filmed by Roy Wolford, the Northern photographer. He was in a P-61 and uh, basically recorded the whole thing. Roy Wolford was a fantastic aerial photographer. There was a meeting going down on down at Northrop between Jack Northrop and Stuart Symington and all the big wigs. And they were waiting when they said, yeah, the thing actually went into a spin and we got film of it. They ordered them to land at Muroc, at Edwards, and have the photo lab at Edwards develop the film and then fly it down to Northrop. So they did that. So everybody was waiting for it, and the film was blank. <laughs> Roy Wolford had never allowed the Edwards photo, New York photo lab to, uh, to basically uh, <laughs> do it before, and said, I, I, I don't know. So yeah, I talked to him about that. He said, I, to my, I will never know what really happened. But we, he said, yes, I filmed it. And he said, it would have been really spectacular. And when they got it, the film was blank. Anyway, next slide. OK, why be 49 stability is the other issue that a lot of people said, well, the test, the Air Force test pilot said it was unstable. unstable. The guy who said that, said that was uh, Major Bob Cardenas. And he has spent his entire life saying, I did not say it was unstable. I said it had like neutral stability, which was true. Flying wings without augmentation basically are marginal stability and they have got a lot of tricks about it. That's the advantage of a digital fly-by-wire system. It masks all those characteristics. But they didn't have those, they, those things. They didn't even have an, analog computers in those things. They had a yaw stabilizer as part of the autopilot, because the autopilot was invented in the 1920s. Just used a gyro of the system, the servos. But, uh, but basically, he said, I never said it was unstable, because it wasn't. Said it just had marginal stability. The Northrop, uh, Jack Northrop gave a presentation of the Royal Aeronautical Society in 1947. He said low pitch damping, a fugoid, which is what you call the roller coaster maneuver. If you let go of the controls of an airplane and you got it turned up, it will go like this. So it'll change altitude for airspeed, sort of like a roller coaster. But typically, the period of that with an airplane with a tail on the back is about, it's about a minute and a half to two minutes. But with a flying wing, it's about 10 seconds. So as a result, you got to damp that out a lot faster. Because if you're trying to bomb somebody, you'd like to stay at a constant altitude instead of being going like this all the time. And there, that comes up with the Gordon bomb site, which I'll describe in a minute. It's got low lateral damping with no tail, low side force, etc. So as a result, the fiber, when you give it a rudder cut kick, it basically does like this, five or six overshoots before it dies out. You said, yeah, that's a characteristic of it. But the B-35 and the B-49 had always been planned to have an autopilot, which included a yaw damper. And that may sound really weird, but the KC-135 yaw damper is part of the autopilot. And uh, the KC-135 has a bad Dutch roll also, as do many swept wing airplanes. 
we actually, as a joke, at test pilot school, we would give our fighter pilots rides in the C-135 and say, okay, we're coming in to land, and you got to turn off the autopilot and say, now, see if you control can control the Dutch roll. Because you've got to lead your movements, especially in a big airplane. So usually by what you think you're doing, you're damping the Dutch roll with the ailerons and maybe the rudder pedals, you're usually increasing it. And I was standing between my one of my marine fighter pilot buddies and all like that, and I literally was clutching onto both tires because he let the Dutch roll go so bad that we were going through about 25 degree wing, wing rocks and we were coming down the final. I said, boy, I'll bet the guy in the tower is wondering what's going on. <clears throat> ship number two, the one that crashed, had the autopilot. Ship number one did not, so as a result, most of the testing was done on ship one, which did not have the benefit of stability and augmentation. Next slide. YB-49 bombing. Uh, the Air Force pilot that I was lucky enough to hear at, uh, at uh, Edwards, Rush Schley, basically said they never cured the bombing problem. It was a terrible bomber and all like that. And I said, and they actually conducted tests and I actually found the bombing scores for the first series of tests to compare a YB-49 with a B-29. And they used the Norton bombsite. Now, the YB-49 is designed to fly at 40,000 feet at jet speeds, 450 miles an hour. The B-29 is more like 25,000 feet, more like 300 miles per hour. Nevertheless, the Norton bombsite was really designed for the B-17. and. The way it works, you can go, you can look at this later on. When you look through a telescope at the ground, then you pick out a prominent point on the ground, then you sync things using knobs so you know what the ground speed and drift is. Then you swivel the telescope to find the sight. Then you put the sight on the target you want to hit. And then you use the knobs to keep the pipper, you might say, on the on the target as as you're approaching it. The problem was with the YB-49, anytime the pilot changed the heading, he excited the Dutch roll of the airplane. So now he had to damp out the thing because ship one didn't have the yaw damper. He had to he had to do a dance with the uh, yoke and the rudder pedals to damp out uh, this duck walk, so to speak. Meanwhile, the poor bombardier is looking at the ground through this <laughs> dancing telescope. And it took usually about nine minutes to accomplish a bombing run, and often the bombardier would puke during it because it was so bad, the motion was so bad. So. But the B-49 was planned to use, yeah, it's got an optical bomb site, but it's going to use radar all the time, just like the Lancasters started doing in uh, Europe at the beginning of World or middle of World War II. So the B-49 bombing error was twice that of the B-29. Later, they put the autopilot in ship one, and it did improve, but it was still worse. And Rush Schley said, no, he said, I, I would fly chase on the B-49. And when the bombs came out, sometimes they would just fly along in the slipstream of the B-49 for a while, which means the bomb will go along. Sometimes they'll come out, and they'll go boom, straight down, which means they're really short. Sometimes, basically, they'll just sort of wander aimlessly from side to side, maybe hitting the airplane. But, but said, uh, really, so he said that they, they kept changing spoilers. The YB-49 and B-35 had really weird bomb, uh, bomb bays. They were like roll-top desks. Instead of the bomb uh, doors sticking out in the airstream, they got rolled into the wind because 
you wanted to minimize drag even while you're actually bombing. So as a result, the roll top bomb bay doors were a terrible idea. They jam and all like that. So that was a really bad idea. So some of the separation problems, even after the autopilot were installed and you had a damper, uh, were due to separation uh, problems with aerodynamics. And I was at the armament test center and I dropped a lot of bombs and chased a lot of bombs. And sometimes you, you want to duck because the bomb would go off on its own a little tangent. You have to worry about that. Next slide. Okay, so that was the end of the B-49, because in reality, what they could not tell anyone was that the atomic bomb was really fat, and it would not fit in the weapons bays of the B-49, because they were little shallow bays that were only designed for a maximum 4,000 pound bomb. And I actually found uh, the rubble of a 3,000 pound bomb out on the bombing range at Edwards and all like that. It was quite fat. So a 4,000 pounder would have been even fatter, and it wouldn't have fit in the bay. The, the 10,000 pound uh, atomic plutonium weapon we use would not have fitted in the base of the B-49. The B-47 was faster. You gotta remember the B-49 was the B-35, which was supposed to be a 300 mile an hour bomber, but with engines that would drive it to over 400. As a result, it was quite draggy, because the wing was thick. Thin thickness to cord ratio is what you need to approach transonic speeds. B-47 had it. So uh, actually the B-49 set a coast to coast speed record going to Washington to be demonstrated to President Truman. And the B-47 beat it by an hour the next day. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of the speed difference. So the RB-49 was proposed as a long-range recce. They proposed an RB-35 and then an RB-49 and all like that. Because one thing about a flying wing is it should have long legs. It doesn't have to drop bombs to kill anyone. It drops photo flash bombs to take pictures at night. And I did that in Vietnam and got shot at a lot for it. But it actually does quarter of a billion candle power actually lights things up pretty well, which is what, what we had in the RF war. So, so they built one and they flew it briefly in 1950, but the Air Force was really losing interest. Budgets were really cut. The B-49 was going to be really expensive. So instead they say, we'll just buy a bunch of RB-50s, which are just souped up B-29s to be the recce bombers. So the RB-49 was grounded and it was scrapped in 1953. Next slide, please. This is a picture of the last of the flying wings. It is sitting on the ground at what is now Ontario Airport. It's actually, uh, they told me that there was a vineyard around it, so I suspect it actually was Vineyard Avenue is where it actually was. I've had two different people come up to me and say when they were kids, the thing was just sitting out there in the open and they'd ride their bikes and there was a hole in the fence and they would climb inside the RV-49 and play jet pilot. And the guards knew them and waved at them and all like that, but nobody was interested. So uh, two different people have told me that thing and I said, wow. I said the Plains of Fame Museum opened in the 1960s and it wasn't that far away. And what a lot of people don't know is in order to move the B-49s, you could swivel the landing gear 90 degrees and tow it like a really long house trailer. <laughs> I said, wouldn't it have been cool if they could have put that down at the Plains of Fame Museum? But they didn't, so it was actually scrapped. So this was the end of North of big flying wings, or was it? Next slide. Enter the B-2 bomber, 1980. It's not quite the same as the B-2, except it does have exactly the same span, 172 feet, six inches. Uh, we have a 5,000 square foot wing instead of the 4,000 that the B-49 actually had. 
we have four 18,000 pound thrust turbofans versus their eight 4,000 pound turbofans. The uh, B49 weighed about 200,000. We weigh over 300,000 when we're fully loaded. We have two large side-by-side -side weapons of aims. Our flight controls, we have three elevons on each side. The B-49 had one, and some other flappery things that nobody ever used. So we have a very agile airplane, because we have a lot of airplanes, one of our elevons. One of the reasons we are shaped like a W is to give us more space to put elevons on the wings. And we are digital fly-by-wire. We are the first military airplane to be on redundant digital fly-by-wire. Next slide. And there she is on her first flight. As a matter of fact, notice the elevons. The drag rudders are out on the very wing tip. Those other three surfaces inboard of it are actually elevons. And you'll see them moving around a little, little bit. You don't have to move them very much because they're so big. You really don't have to move them very much. We, in addition to being a high-altitude bomber, were also a low-altitude, high-speed bomber. So we had to do a more thorough testing than the White Eagle and I did. This is my favorite shot, the Easter egg shot. Here it is coming in for uh, the first landing. And it was you notice the drag rudders are open. The B-49 was going to have those four vestigial tails to give you additional side area, of sort of an artificial tail at, uh, at uh, low speed. And uh, we basically, what we did was, because we're stealthy, we didn't want those tails where the bad guys could see them. So as a result, what we do is we just open the drag rudders 45 degrees when we're at low speed going into land at home. So as a result, we give ourselves artificial tails just for our landing. Next slide. Test program. That's not a typo on line one. That's 50,000 plus hours of ground tests for flight controls. <clears throat> When your airplanes end up costing $2 billion each, you want to make damn sure you got it right before you fly them. <coughs> we have a total of six bombers. We got 5,000 flying hours on those airplanes in eight years, and that is really good because each one of our missions, because of all the instrumentation we have, is kind of like a space shuttle launch or something like that. So we don't fly usually until We've got a lot of confidence in the airplane. We basically fly, and we would fly for over six hours, look at the data, and then the next week we'd go on to the next step. But when you got six bombers, some of them specialize in certain things, other ones the same shape and do a lot of things. So we were quite busy. Comparisons, the B-35 and B-49 had six bombers, 400 hours in five years of flight test. And you'll notice there are no more of the big flying wings in existence, whereas all six of our bombers are now operational. B-2 experiences, I'm going to go over this quickly. High angle of attack, stability, and the bombing platform, just like the YB-49. Next slide. No deliberate stalls permitted. The computers won't let you do it. We have an angle of attack limiter by our digital flight control system, just like the F-16 does, and the F-18, and the F-22, and everything else. Flight tests, but we were the guys who had to gather the data in order to decide what the limits should be. So as a result, originally we did not have the limits set, because we were the ones to collect the data. When I was not flying the B-2, my specialty is avionics. Ship 3 and Ship 4 were my airplanes, and I got most of my 500 hours in those airplanes. But Ship 1 and 2 were the ones who were doing the flight controls works. And I was usually the test director in the control room because I was the only test air crew that was available to be a test director. So uh, only once, because I did all the high angle, test director for all the high angle of attack testing and all like that, 
one only once did I hear a what the and in my headset I also heard simultaneously from the engineers in our control room terminate terminate which means knock off what you're doing and basically we're at high speed high mock or high angle of attack and the airplane made an uncommanded motion and uh, we have 9,000 parameters streaming real time down to our control room and about 30 engineers of the control room. NASA actually came to us to see the way we had our control room laid out so that they could model it for the space shuttle. But anyway, so they said, what was that? And it was a pitch break that the airplane actually pitched up slightly. By coincidence, the test pilot was flying it was my classmate at test pilot school, uh, uh, Frank Burke, who sat right next to me and all like that. So, <coughs> so I said, okay, we're going to have to discuss that one. So the engineers came to me and pleaded with me on bended knee. And they said, we know there's something wrong, but can we slow up just a little bit and do that test point again? And I said, you know, that's Frank Burke, the, flight, the CTF director there, don't you? And we, we don't usually cowboy. So you persuade me as to why that would be really valuable. And they persuaded me. So basically, I said, okay. So I went to upper management and said, we are going to repeat that point slower to see if it repeats that behavior or whether it is a function of the speed. And then I told Frank, and of course, he knew me. So he said, okay. And we, and it, it behaved perfectly, so we said it was, it was to the speed, and I said that will save us months of trying to figure out what happened, because that's in what you call the uh, dynamic flight area, transonic flight, and it was actually due to a shock wave forming on the inlet, and uh, so what we did was we analyzed it, we simulated it. Put in software fixes for it, verified that the software fixes fixed it, then we went on with the desk. So basically, uh, that's the advantage today of being able to have almost real time analysis. Because they had lots of gas, so they actually went off and did something else for about a half an hour while I, we, we discussed it, and they said, we really would like to have it repeat that point at a lower speed and he said, he said you have no idea how much that's time that saved us next slide active digital flight control system uh, you'll notice uh, actually that picture was taken I just dropped that 5,000 pound bomb but it gives you an idea how big our weapons bay doors no goddamn piano roll doors. <laughs> and with a B2, we got manly doors that you can actually park an RV with motorcycles behind in each one of our weapon space. Uh, our bays are really huge. We can carry uh, we can carry up to forty thousand pounds of bombs. Uh, actually, when you open and close the weapon bay doors, it actually caused the airplane to kind of pitch up and down because we had a 5,000 square foot wing and we just opened this giant hole in the bottom of it and it affects the circulation around the wing. And so as a result, it was surprisingly sensitive. But once we discovered that, said, okay, we can take care of that. Rapid throttle movements, actually, because our exhausts and then looks are on top of the wing also affected the thing. So it said, if you really move the throttle fast like that, it will cause the airplane to do like that. And when you're aerial refueling 20 feet under the belly of a tanker, that's not a fun thing. So we actually were able to correct that too. We had high speed pitch oscillations. Nobody used the F word, which is flutter. <laughs> but uh, actually, it's not unknown. The F-16 has exactly the same problem if you have a certain fuel configuration etc. The wings have a tendency to kind of flex and it feels like you're driving over uh, the ruts on a road where dirt road where it's rained recently. It's a very low vibration I like that. And crosswind effect during like takeoff and landing. It's a little bit tricky because we don't have a tail 
So the digital flight control system pretends we do have a tail. But when you touch down on the runway, now the pilot uses the rudders to steer the airplane like a tricycle. And uh, basically, the flight control system wants to argue with them. Said, no, 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 that's, that's not right. So we had to correct that too. We actually, believe it or not, at one time could not taxi in a straight line with a B-2. Neither can I. Yeah. The reason being that most airplanes have the main gear fairly close together and the nose wheels way in front, way in front. The flying wing has the main wheels way far apart and the nose gear is just barely in front of it. On the ground simulators, they actually modeled the Boeing 767 taxi performance. And the actual B-2 is totally unlike that. We actually had to do an interesting test program in itself when we discovered we actually could not taxi in the straight line. We still have the scuff marks on our taxi way to prove it. Next slide. This gives you some idea of the flights we did. And you notice this is out over the water ranges at Vandenberg. And uh, you notice the nice laminar flow over a flying wing. Jack Northup would have been proud because of the moisture uh, you get out over the ocean. And if you looked really closely, and the chase actually picked that up when we were at high speed, you could see shock waves forming on the inlet, which actually helped solve that other problem. Next slide. I already covered this. Next slide. This was our first attempt at doing a short field takeoff on the B-2. And it surprised the hell out of us. It was really short. What we had neglected was the fact that a big wing and ground cushion will take off well below its normal takeoff speed. So they had the stick back in their laps and basically the airplane took off like a shot and as soon as it got out of the ground effect, the high angle of attack thing, that's what you see the the computers are basically saying, whoa, wait a minute. So basically it's trying to pitch you over and then back up and all like that. So the pilots, being test pilots, immediately relaxed the back pressure. So we said, do not try the old Cessna 150 trick for a short field takeoff with a yoke back in your belly, because you will not like the results. So we had to modify that. Next slide. B-2 bombing platform, uh, I did a lot of bombing myself. We did not have a bomb site, so I didn't get air sick. I still have never been air sick. We were the first aircraft operational with GPS guided weapons. I dropped the first ones. We had no storage separation problems at all. Where our big heavy nuclear weapons and GPS guided weapons, cartridges are used to push them away and through the boundary layer. Our rack stored weapons, we can carry 8,500 pound bombs, and now we can carry 80 GPS guided SART 500 pound bombs, which is a hell of a weapon. But uh, again, they had no trouble falling through the slipstream. So we, we actually have spoilers when we open the doors. We have spoilers that look sort of like flatjack riddles that swing out into the airstream, and they were more net. We, we never had to tamper with them at all. Never had any store separations at all. Next slide. That's a really good bomb stream. Like I said, that's my business. So, yeah, that's really impressive. The camera is sideways, you're not. So, but anyway, again, that's, those are high drag snake eyes, as we call them. That's my bomb. 5,000 pounder deep penetrating. First GPS JDAM weapon. It's got laser guided bomb accuracy without a laser. Next slide. So, for the future, because this was said, what is the future going to bring? 
at the Society of Experimental Test Pilots, you have to always end up with lessons learned. So I said, flight test is still necessary. Ground predictions were not perfect. We had nonlinear areas, transonic area and ground effect. Dynamic situations, the bay doors, the follow response. Large wings are very sensitive to seemingly small changes because our database is mainly with airplanes with medium-sized wings and tails. So an airplane that's nothing but a wing, uh, it, we had some surprises. Next slide. Prototypes test beds are a good thing. The N1 showed that the basic concept of clamshells would work, but it also showed that stick reversal problem in high AOA. The N9M, fortunately, we did not have the forward opening speed brakes, <laughs> uh, so we validated that. And the B2 actually used a variable stability test bed, which is a C1, uh, C131, uh, and they flew a lot of software tests on the flight control laws in an actual airplane before we flew them in the B2. And the C-135 avionics test bed, which is what I flew before I flew B-2, and this is it right here, actually flew 600 flights. Because underneath that funny looking nose that looks, whoops, looks like an RC-135 is actually the B-2 radar. You dropped a bomb. Yeah, I dropped a bomb. <laughs> That's still all I uh, next slide. But Jack Norther actually wanted the B-2 not just to be a weapon of war, he wanted it to be an airliner. This is a 1949 Hollywood movie set, prop set, which I love. Flying saucer hats were apparently in. That is, they made an airline mock-up of B-35 and basically use footage taken from the B-49 in order to do this. That is the tail gun gunner's position. They turn it into an observation dome like uh, railroad cars use. Now, don't you wish you had this much room and this much <laughs> in a modern jet aircraft? No bag of peanuts here. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, I arranged to have this picture taken, uh, actually. Uh, we hosted the uh, guys from Chino uh, with the N9M to come to South Base, which is where we are. That is ship six there, and that's the N9M in front of it. It is in front of a modern hangar on South Base I have a black and white photo, probably taken by Roy Wolford, of the YB-49 with that N9M parked in front of it. And the picture was taken about 50 yards from that picture. Because they tore down, they moved those hangars. They're now behind Air Force Test Pilot School. But when they decided the B-2 was going to be tested at South Base, by coincidence, they built those hangars almost in exactly the same place originally. So I deliberately set up that picture with the cherry picker for exactly that reason. Next slide. So that basically shows the comparison between the YB-49 and the B-2. That's actually my favorite view of the airplane. Looks like a boomerang. I said they should call it the B-2 boomerang, it always comes back. And that's the end. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Outstanding, sir. Outstanding.